I'm Mary Lloyd Ireland, professor at the University of Kentucky, an orthopedic surgeon. I gave this talk at the Kentucky Orthopedic Society in 2017. It is entitled Physician in Training Advice, the three C's, change, control, and character. This was directed at orthopedic residents, but I think it rings true for those of us who have been in practice for, for quite some time as I have. For the younger generation, this is a dictionary. This is the Webster's New Collegiate Dictionary that my grandmother gave me in 1964. Dictionaries and definitions of words should always be looked up, particularly if you're not quite sure what they mean. So in that vein, change. It is an act or result of something becoming different. Change is what life is all about. Change is predictable. Change is going to happen. Control. It's the power to make decisions. Ability to make somebody or something do what you want. So that's control. In my practice, I like having control to do the best for my patients. I like to control my environment in the operating room. I like to control decisions made in the office. Not that we're control freaks as physicians, but we want to control things so the outcome for our patients is going to be the best and what we would want for our own family. Character, mental or moral qualities, distinctive to an individual. We build more and more character as we age based on what we see, how we react to things, and by the end of your career, you will have a lot of character. I was a swimmer. I actually begged my parents to allow me to swim year-round at age 11. A little different than most youth athletes of the year 2017, where the parents might be pushing them into the pool as opposed to begging to swim. But my comp competition or competitive spirit was uncovered, as this Herald Later article mentioned, and I think that athletics does allow us to be more competitive in life, um, including if you go into male-dominated professions like orthopedics. But I think we do need to be competitive for life, and that does start in our youth with sports, which are very important in moderation. Similarities in sports arena to life, competition, caring, attitude, courage, and success. We're in the game to win. I did a fellowship at the Houston Clinic with Dr. James Andrews. I grew up in Lexington and then went away for 17 years for college education, medical school, residency. And I had an opportunity to return to Lexington, Kentucky, my hometown, because the football coach, Jerry Claiborne, asked the athletic trainer, Al Green and Sue Stanley, why don't our players who have knee surgery ever return to football? And this was in the mid-80s, so a big change occurred in our surgical techniques, and that was arthroscopy. And now, many years later, we have great arthroscopic techniques, and the next change may be injections. That may be what you young residents need to keep up with of injecting biologics into joints and hopefully preventing arthritis. We haven't done very well with preventing arthritis with knee surgery, but we have gotten people back in the game. So in the mid 80s, the orthopedists who had been taking care of the teams didn't keep up or recruit someone for advanced arthroscopic techniques and I had an opportunity to return home and the door was open for me to return home, which was a great decision. It's always good to practice where people know you and want to see you as a patient. Coach Claiborne said women are into everything now, industry, medicine, athletics, as long as they do their job, it's okay. So there was not any bias against my being a female and taking care of a Division I football team. He accepted me, as did the players, because I knew what I was doing. A locker room should be a locker room and a 
medical area, athletic training area should be an athletic training area. So we didn't really have any problems with me being a female taking care of the male athletes as there were also female athletic trainers as well there should be. This is Tom Brower. He was the chairman of orthopedic surgery, which was then a division. Orthopedic surgery at the University of Kentucky began in 1964, and he was the first head of orthopedic surgery division until 1988. He was an excellent diagnostician when we were asked to come back by the University of Kentucky and provide orthopedic care. We went to the university and we said, let's start a sports medicine program at the University of Kentucky. Dr. Brower didn't really think that sports medicine was a subspecialty, so he sent us into the private sector and I began my practice as a private practitioner, initially based out of Central Baptist in 1985. I didn't really want to be a trailblazer, I just wanted to take care of athletes and fortunately I was able to do this with the doors being opened by Coach Claiborne and the athletic training staff at the University of Kentucky. I did happen to be the only female or the first female to take care of a Division I football team, but that didn't really matter to me. I just wanted to take care of the team and I was honored and blessed to be able to return back home and do that. These were some pictures early on of taking care of the UK football uh, team with the Gardner brothers down in the lower left and in the lower right is Dr. Houston with a smile, Dr. Andrews on the right not wanting his picture taken at the sideline of the University of Kentucky football. So what happens if you have somebody that comes in after their fellowship and they are a self-proclaimed, I know more than you do, I have more advanced techniques. We call him or her Dr. Hotshot. So if that newly trained sports medicine orthopedist comes into town with ads, self-proclaimed greatness, what do you do? Communicate. Call that person up. They may not realize what you have done in that community and it's always good to communicate. I think we forget that as physicians. So get out of your foxhole and talk to that person and tell them how you feel they would be better accepted in the community by behavior modification. So when I did my fellowship with Dr. Andrews, we had a lot of very famous athletes, Jack Nicholas. I didn't come into town saying, hey, I know Jack Nicholas, and I'm going to take care of every golfer in town because I've met Jack Nicholas. I came into town and put my head down and took care of athletes and didn't toot my own horn, so to speak. Didn't need to. If you do good work, your best patient increase in numbers is happy patients. So make your patients happy, and they'll send friends, families, and other members to you, and they're great patients referred by another patient. The ethics of sports medicine. What is ethics? It's what we ought to do. It deals with the principles of moral values governing relationships. Again, back to the dictionary. Ethics in sports medicine can sometimes be an oxymoron where everybody wants to take care of the University of Kentucky, and maybe there are situations why where people will spend money, hospitals might spend money, there may be advertising campaigns, etc. So again, just think about ethics. It's what we ought to do. Who teaches his ethics? Parents initially. In practice, ethics is taught by the way we practice from our role models, from our mentors during our residency and during our fellowship. But we should communicate more with other physicians and discuss specific cases, ethics, and behavior. That's the way to make change by communication and discussion. In my career, 32 years now, as of 2017, 22 years I was in private practice at Kentucky Sports Medicine, and for the last 10 years I've been at the University of Kentucky. Big difference in the way practices are and the control that you have, but 
much less hassling about business and uh, other things. So I've been very happy to be at the University of Kentucky for the last 10 years. These were my partners, Dr. Smith and Dr. Grant at Kentucky Sports Medicine. Cool logo. Mistakes. It could be the purpose of your life is only to serve as warning for others. This really isn't what we want, but we do have to think about making mistakes and how we act and what we do. In my practice, I made a mistake by not overseeing my business as I should have, and my office manager stole from me. He stole probably about $150,000 without my really knowing it. And he ended up working for an outside county as a bookkeeper. So I pursued this case as in civil uh, court to make sure his felony would be a conviction, and so a convicted felon cannot work for the government. I didn't want anybody else to have to feel so bad and feel like you don't can't run a business and that you cannot uh, keep your employees uh, happy because money's going out the door. So don't trust. You got to trust no one, pretty much. So I was the victim, but then you got to move on. So I was happy that I pursued it and got him convicted, went to court. I've never been sued personally for, for my practice, but I did have to go to court to get my office manager who stole from me convicted as a felon. This is some of the articles around that time. And Will Rogers quoted, I think it is true, maybe true, more now than when Will Rogers said it. Some men rob you with a six gun, some with a fountain pen. And my office manager certainly robbed me with a fountain pen and never really felt he had done anything wrong. Over the years, I've had 22 fellows when I was in private practice. It's been great. This is uh, Scott Jackson in the middle, my first fellow, Sue Ott on the right, and then Chris Doherty down below. They taught me more than I taught them, but it's been a blessing to have had fellows, and I still am very involved with teaching at the University of Kentucky of residents and fellows. Give it back. I was a team physician at the University of Kentucky for 13 years and Eastern Kentucky University for longer than that, for 18 years. It was a really great ride standing on sidelines when Coach Curry was fired, I was asked to give up my team physician role, and Dr. Darren Johnson was at the university, and the decision was made for the University of Kentucky athletes to be treated at the newly created UK Sports Medicine. So I did get a nice plaque from CM Newton at halftime from the UK football team in honor of my dedicated service, which was great. I really wanted to keep on taking care of the university, but life goes on. It's been said that loyalty is the weakest of human emotions. We have to move on. If you lose coverage of a team, You've got to stick to your ethical principles and just move on. You'll get over it. You may be concerned about it. It's not your fault. Get over it and go on to something else. I did and have had a very productive career and have been happier, actually. Complications. How do you manage complications if you have something? If you're a surgeon, complications are going to happen. If you're using new equipment, you got to know how to get out of trouble. Arthroscopic equipment instruments can break. It's frustrating, but you have to be honest. You have to be patient. You have to show empathy and tell the patient and their family what has gone on and how you're going to fix it. And be honest and communicate. My husband posted this on Facebook 
when I was advanced to clinical professor at the University of Kentucky. I really have not performed 50,000 surgeries, but I'm happy that he thinks I have. But this is uh, an interesting observation that he made. How many lawsuits have been filed? Zero. That's the definition of brilliance, dedication, and perfection. And I think to be successful in a career, you have to have a have to have a support system like your spouse, family, friends to get you through this. This was a great post and a surprise. There are some textbooks that I think are very good to read as you go through your career, read them at different times of your career. Atul Gawande is a general surgeon from Boston and this is a really good one named Better, and it's a surgeon's notes on performance. And there's certain parts of this that may apply to your life during certain phases of your career, but I think this is a good one to have in your library, particularly about self-awareness, mindfulness. You got to keep up. You have to go to courses. If you're an arthroscopic surgeon, things will change very quickly. Go to courses, have courses, work with industry on advancements and courses. Will Rogers, again, even if you are on the right track, you will get run over if you just stand there. So this is operating with one of my colleagues in Bangkok, Thailand. I think it's really great to travel and to visit your colleagues. This was at the ACL study group with Dr. Shanine in 2010 in Bangkok. This is a chapter that I wrote in this textbook, Clinics and Sports Medicine. My chapter, which was really a hard one to write, was Balancing Life as a Team Physician. And I came up with 10 commandments that I think are, are very good. And I will suggest that you look up this article and this book, what you can do on my website. I'll start with one, do the right thing, always, no exceptions. Number two, be an advocate. Number three, don't demand respect, earn it. Number four is loyalty. Number five, communicate. Number six is aim high. Number seven, enjoy your role as a team physician. Be passionate about it, but have fun. Remember the five A's. Number nine, dare to care. Number 10, don't forget your family and friends. They won't be with you forever. This is my family, so don't forget them. Make sure they know that you're supporting them as much as they are supporting you. Whining, that won't get you anywhere. Don't whine. I think we all need resilience in our lives. What is the definition? It's the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties. Toughness. An ecologic definition of capacity of an ecosystem to respond to a perturbation of disturbance by resisting damage and recovering quickly. So I think that's a good definition of we get perturbated all the time. We get disturbed. So we have to resist damage to ourselves and recover quickly. In ecology, this would be things such as fires, floods, natural and politically forth healthcare changes. So we have to be resilient and get through these changes and work more closely together and communicate. We are the leaders in medicine. We're the ones that see the patients, diagnose, order tests, treat the patients. So we need to be very resilient through these healthcare change times and work together and resume leadership and be at the table when these changes are made. This was a symposium that was at the University of Kentucky. 
UK Auditorium marquee had this up. PhDs, Dr. Aramata and Cotton were the speakers. And on the marquee outside of the room, it was billed as Building Resistance. So managing stress, building resistance, the imperative for self-care for all healthcare professionals. When in actuality, the true name and the true topic was building resilience. So it's very interesting that whoever put that up, which was probably a healthcare professional, put up resistance as opposed to resilience. A little Freudian. Correct title, resilience. Don't resist resilience. Be resilient. Mindfulness. I think we'll hear more and more about mindfulness. And what is that? It's the quality or state of being conscious or aware of something. The mental state achieved by focusing one's awareness on the present moment. Focus in the present while calmly acknowledging and accepting one's feelings, thoughts, and bodily sensations. Even as surgeons, I think we need to work harder at being mindful, at taking care of ourselves and get into this mindfulness state. It will make us better for ourselves and we will better be able to treat our patients. There are some clinics, university, that are requiring mindfulness training. So is it mindful as you see on the left or should it really be mindful where we're thinking of other things and cleansing our minds? Sounds warm and fuzzy but I think this is real and we need to be more mindful. Mayo Clinic School of Continuous Professional Development is requiring mindfulness training. There are courses that are taken online and other courses that are um, that are person to person, so to speak. Optimizing provider potential, beating burnout. We can have burnout in a lot of different areas in our lives, and we need to be mindful of that and create mindfulness to make us better doctors and to make us be able to practice longer if that's what we want to do. What's a mentor? It's a wise and trusted counselor or teacher. What do these peer mentors do? They instill confidence, enhance social skills, enforce reliability. The word mentor comes from Greek mythology with Maculus, and he was assigned a mentor by his father. So in summary, you young orthopedic surgeons, physicians, and us older ones, should heed this. Be a leader. Be the head coach. Think outside of the box. Be positive. Be passionate. Be like Jean-Luc Picard. Pay attention and drive the USS Enterprise into the future. Be in control. Be Jean-Luc Picard. I visited Duke for a meeting and went in Camden Arena. They have a great museum right next to that. And this is Coach Krzyzewski's quote, I don't look at myself as a basketball coach. I look at myself as a leader who happens to coach basketball. And I think this is the way we physicians should look at ourselves. I don't look at myself as a orthopedic surgeon. I look at myself as an orthopedic as a leader who happens to be an orthopedic surgeon. We are all leaders. This is Dr. Frank Bassett, Kentucky native, who served as the team physician at Duke for many years, and he is in multiple Hall of Fames. Best Medicine, A Physician's Guide to Effective Leadership, 
Again, we are leaders. We need to take that leadership banner and be at the table. Be a leader who brings about healthy change while remaining true to the ancient commitments of the founders of this profession. This is another book, The Creativity Cure, written by Carrie Barron and Alton Barron. I heard Carrie, who's a psychoanalyst, speak, and she is a great speaker. Alton Barron is a orthopedist who is a hand surgeon, and they live in Austin, Texas. So this is how to build happiness with your own two hands. We surgeons like to do things with our hands. And whether for me it's oftentimes taking pictures, I like doing something with my hands and creating. For some it might be doing athletics, it might be running. Do something to reset your mind and be mindful and physically feel better. I would suggest this as good reading for all of us. The Creativity Cure, Do-It-Yourself Prescription for Happiness. Expect the unexpected. We talked about change. You never see it coming. Bad things do happen to good people. This is Sheryl Sandberg's book, Option B. It covers facing adversity, building resilience, and finding joy. Sheryl Sandberg is with Facebook, CEO, and that's her picture on the right with her author and counselor, Adam Grant. Her husband, who was the Survey Monkey CEO, died suddenly of a heart attack. And this book came from What Are My Options? So you never see it coming. This will help you prepare for changes, whether it's loss of a friend or a family member, change of job, or other losses. So I would highly recommend option B. Dr. Ben Kibler and I gave this presentation. Dr. Kibler started in practice a little bit earlier in Lexington. We have always been friendly competitors. He has really been able to establish excellent research in private practice at the Lexington Clinic throughout his career. And his topic with this physician and training advice was based on Stephen Covey's work, Start with the End in Mind. Stephen Covey published The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People in the 80s. And a lot of these principles remain true with how to combine your career and life. So in your life, you will have four aspects, personal, social, spiritual, and professional, as abbreviated here. And in different times of our life, some of these boxes will be bigger, and this will change. So it is important for you to try to put a percentage on how much of your life are these. So it's some parts of your life your professional life, as in this diagram, would be very big, maybe when you're starting into practice. And your personal life may be second. And then your social and spiritual life may be smaller. This is training early in your career and sometimes your entire career. It is interesting if you have others in your lives do a similar diagram and tell you where they think you're spending your time. Uh, and that may give you a good reflection on if you're spending your time wisely and also look are you happy and passionate. So again the time spent in our 100% of life can change. So now you can see the professional and the personal life are getting much closer together whereas the spiritual and the social are still down. This is when you're pursuing your personal careers goals and again, you need to see what is the best balance for you and also ask those 
your loved ones and your friends, if this is really what you're doing, this may be what you perceive, and they may, may think that there's a different way that this is divided up into these four aspects. Difficult life situations, sometimes the spiritual can be the greatest, followed by so social and then professional and personal. So again, these difficult life situations are going to happen, and you'll see a difference in the way that these four aspects take up your time. These areas will change in size throughout your life, depending on your circumstances. Periodically, again, get somebody else, relatives, friends, give you an assessment of what these percentages are. And there's no area should ever be excluded. Try to emphasize balance between the areas. This is great advice. Always fit your medical career into your life, not your life into your medical career. Say it one more time. Always fit your medical career into your life, not your life into your medical career. It's your funeral. Representatives of four aspects of your life, personal, social, spiritual, professional. What would you like these representatives to say? If you can write your own obituary, what would you like these individuals to say? Live your life so they can honestly say those words. Circle of life. The week before this talk, the Las Vegas massacre occurred. 58 people were killed. My husband's audiovisual company, Post Time, had two individuals there live streaming this country western concert. They didn't expect to be in the middle of a war zone, but they were. So we need to support each other. Bad things are going to happen. There was blood all over the place. They have worked with me doing surgical tapings, but nothing like this. So we need to support each other, talk to each other. If you find somebody might be depressed, talk with them, get them help. We are going to work to get these two individuals some stress reduction, psychological assessment for them and their families to be able to talk about this harrowing experience that changed them for the rest of their lives. This is the medical team at the University of Kentucky in the late 80s. I'm on the right. Al Green is next to me, Sue Stanley next to her, and John Perrine is our internal medicine physician. Circle of life. Al Green left when I left the University of Kentucky, and he lives in Florida and works at Florida Southern College. He is an athletic trainer, not at a D1 school, but enjoying his career and is passionate. His wife, Sue, St Sue Stanley, is an educator and an athletic trainer and works at his side. Al's grandson, Dalton Green, became very ill recently. And so Al worked for Coach Curry on his staff and for Coach Claiborne. And now Al Green is standing next to the University of Kentucky football coach now, Coach Stoops, and the starting quarterback, Stephen Johnson, and Al's son, who is over Dalton, who's lying in bed. Fortunately, Dalton is getting better, but all of a sudden, this young 11-year-old stops walking. They thought he might have meningitis, but he has a condition called ADEM, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. One week later, he is making significant improvement and the doctors, the neurologists are amazed, and a lot of it was about love and prayer and really a positive attitude that Dalton was going to get better. So the circle of life, Al Green's on the sidelines with other coaches, and then he's in, his hus in a hospital bed next to his uh, grandson, who fortunately is improving. So change is going to happen. Expect the unexpected. Pam Whitehead, a very good friend of mine who was in industry and medicine, orthopedics, and again, a male-dominated profession, the brace business and orthopedic industry. She died of metastatic breast cancer at age 54. 
She had had a diagnosis two years previously, so you never see it coming. Dr. Frank Noyes wrote and delivered her eulogy, and she, described, he, she was described by Dr. Noyes as she was all in for life and fully committed. So hug your friends and families. You never see it coming. Pam Whitehead is a great person, was a great person, and her daughter, Mackenzie, is the spitting image of her, so she lives on. Support those that you can, as long as you can. This audio clip is from David Foster Wallace's commencement speech at Kenyon University. I would strongly suggest that you listen to the whole 20 minutes, but it gives us pause and thoughts about perceptions of things, and this is a very good commencement speech. This is water. Greetings, thanks, and congratulations to Kenyon's graduating class of 2005. There are these two young fish swimming along, and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way, who nods at them and says, morning boys, how's the water? And the two young fish swim on for a bit, and then eventually one of them looks over at the other and goes, what the hell is water? <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. My website is myname.com. Look up other presentations or information on this website.